All right. Uh, so last time we were talking about uh, um, mass storage stuff, USB, the difference between some of those machines, serial ECT, eSATA, that kind of stuff. Um, so a little bit of a tangent, but a good tangent, I suppose. Um, all right, so I want to try to get through this slide set today again. <laughs> we're going to try to get more than one uh, slide. I think we're going to be good. Um, I, I, I hope. All right. So, performance of different vari uh, various levels of storage. We've talked a lot about this. Registers are super fast. Cache is a little bit slower. Main memory is a little bit slower. Disk storage is a lot uh, slower. We even look at access time. So, access time in nanoseconds. Uh, 0.25 to 0.5 nanoseconds for a register. 0.5 to, uh, to 25 for cache. 80 to 250 for main memory. So, you can kind of get an idea here for how... I mean, we already consider main memory to be very fast. So when you look at that access time for main memory and then bandwidth, 1,000 to 5,000 megabytes per second, not to be confused with megabits per second, which is what your internet connections are measured in. So that's megabytes per second. You know, we consider to be, we consider main memory to be very, very fast. Well, when we compare that to registers, where registers are hardware variables that are basically sitting right next to the CPU, you know, the access time is a fraction of what it is for main memory and many, 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 many times faster in terms of bandwidth. Does that make sense? So, huge difference in speed of memory. If we consider this to be fast, what is this? Ridiculous, right? Okay, so, uh, and then we see how it drops off with disk storage. But we also, also, we also look at the typical size. Registers are typically less than one kilobyte in size. Cache, depends how expensive the processor is, but, you know, something in the 16 megabyte, 32 megabyte, 64 megabyte size. So, something measurable in megabytes. Main memory, you know, gigabyte size. And then uh, storage space, I mean, this is good. This is pretty old, right? Greater than 100 gigabytes. You couldn't buy a 100 gigabyte hard drive today. Even then. Yeah, yeah. But I guess, you're, I, I guess you're right. That's close. But, I mean, even typically today, if you went to buy a solid state drive today, wouldn't don't they really start at 256 or 512? 256 probably. I mean, can you still buy a 128 today? Really? Okay. But in any case, when we think of hard drives, we're usually thinking of something in the terabyte range, right? By today's standards. So, uh, and also this is a little old from the magnetic disk perspective. Now we're thinking about things, solid state drives, which is actually flash memory, blah, blah, blah. All right. Now it says registers are managed by the compiler. What does that mean? We start on this end. Disk storage is managed by the operating system. We have a file system manager. We've talked about that. Main memory is managed by the operating system. We have a memory manager. We've talked about that. Cache is managed by the hardware. So we have something that kind of sits between the CPU and main memory that we can use to buffer things. And that's hardware managed with some drivers probably. But what does it mean for registers to be managed by the compiler? What's a compiler? Yeah, high level. A compiler translates high level programming language to a low level programming language. What's a low level programming language? It's a one to one ratio with the other machine. Okay, one to one ratio with the CPU. All right. Well, so what does a high level language code look like? So every instruction in a, I'm sorry, a low level, every instruction in a low level language has exactly, it refers to one magic trick that the CPU knows how to do. Well, some of the magic tricks that the CPU knows how to do is move crap from one register to another. So it's really a compiler that, tr that dictates the low-level language, that dictates how do, we re how do we use those registers. Go ahead. Um, is, that why, is that partially why low-level language can be so fast? Is because you can store what you want to store in the smaller registers? Um, 
why low-level languages can be so fast. Well, they're only as efficient as the programmer wrote them. Um, right. but, but, but down the line there is, I mean, you get to choose at the hardware level how to store stuff. When you're dealing with, uh, um, if you're writing in a low-level language and you're storing something, you're creating your equivalent of a variable. So, you know, and when we write something in Java, we say int a equals 5. Well, we kind of take for granted all the crap that underneath the hood that has to happen in order for that to get created. So part of that is going to be loading the number 5 into a, into a hardware register in preparation of moving it into main memory, real memory. You know, it's not going to live on the CPU long term, but as that gets processed, that's going to be a magic trick that the CPU is having to handle, and the CPU is going to load a 5 into AX, let's say, which is one of the hardware registers. Then it's going to talk to the memory management module to get a memory space and actually end up moving that from there to cache to the uh, uh, actual main memory where the variable ultimately lives. Um, so, you know, it, it says, says managed by the compiler because 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 the compiler produces our low-level code and low-level code, when it works with memory, it's working directly with registers. We don't have access to the main memory system because that's managed by the operating system. Low-level code talks directly to our CPU. Does that make sense? So everything we do, we're having to do in terms of the magic tricks our CPU knows how to do. Um, okay, so that's kind of how these guys... Uh, the evolution of our different memory subsystems. Lower amount of memory here, faster memory here, more expensive memory here, up to slow, but more storage space and inexpensive. All right, so now the flip side of it, so if we're looking at compilers taking an integer and taking it from the register up into main memory, um, how do we go from a disk to a register? So now we think about, we take the compiler. Compiler compiles our high-level code into a low-level code. Well, that's stored on the hard drive. That's the compiled program. Only during runtime does that low-level code actually get executed on the CPU. Okay, so that's stored on the actual hard drive, or our magnetic disk, as they're calling it here. So how does this actually work? When we double-click a program, whether we're, I mean, the example here is an integer A, but you could think of it as even Microsoft Word if you want. So this is a small little tiny piece of Microsoft Word. So we're going to have integer A. Integer A is going to be stored inside of a low-level uh, uh, compiled uh, program, low-level programming language on the disk. That program is going to get loaded into main memory. From main memory, we're going to load each line into cache in some sort of interesting way. So cache is kind of the staging area for getting into the CPU, all right? So we have a, you know, if we think of our low-level program, you know, let's just call it a 1,000 lines of code. And when you first open it, we're going to have the program counter at line zero. And we're going to start walking it one magic trick at a time. So as we get CPU time, we might be able to handle 30 lines. We might be able to handle one line. It depends if we run into I.O. or whatever. But, you know, we're going to start working our way through that file as we get CPU time. So file gets loaded off the, off the hard drive into memory. From memory, when we get CPU time, we start loading commands into cache, which can then quickly jump into the CPU. So sitting in between here is actually our CPU that's going to be doing processing that can actually take something from, well, we'll take an instruction that's been loaded into cache, execute it, possibly do something in a hardware register in preparation for it to move someplace else. Does that make sense? Hardware registers are really, really, really fast, but very temporary. You know, main memory we think of as being fast and basically temporary compared to hard drives, where if you shut the power off to your computer, whatever's on your hard drive is still there. Whatever was in main memory is not. Make sense? Um, but hardware registers on the CPU are extremely temporary. You know, maybe in milliseconds. A, variable, a value might live in there and then be gone because a new program has come in to, to pick up where it left off. Um, I.O. subsystem. It's responsible for memory management of I.O., including buffering, storing data temporarily while it's being transferred. Um, so that's kind of our cache stuff. 
caching, storing parts of data in faster storage for performance. Spooling, the overlapping of output of one job with input of other jobs. Okay, so this kind of gets into what if we have situations where we have multiple CPUs. Two programs working at the same time, and one of them has to kind of buffer something, the output, in preparation for the input for another program. It's called spooling. Um, general device driver interface. So, you know, that's also an I.O. system. We shouldn't just think of I.O. as us talking to the computer. It's also our external USB hard drive talking to the computer. It's our mouse talking to the computer. It's a printer talking to the computer. Those are all input-output type of services. Okay, and drivers for specific hardware devices. Okay, so that just elaborates on the I.O. system. It's a little bit more than just displaying crap to the screen and reading crap in from the user. All right, protection and security. Protection, any mechanism for controlling access of processes or users to resources defined by the OS. So everything about the operating system deals with the resource sharing. We're either trying to manage the CPU, we're trying to manage the memory, we're trying to manage the hard drive. We have a whole bunch of different processes that are all trying to compete for these individual resources and we need to protect them in some way. So an example might be, you know, if we think about protection at the CPU level, if we're dealing with hardware registers, well, we don't want program A to be able to overwrite something that program B wrote in one of the hardware registers unless we've preserved that value in some way that program A can pick up where it left off. Make sense? So we need to protect those resources to make sure that one process is done with it before another process starts. Security, this is something we're all used to. Defense of the system against internal and external attacks, blah, blah, blah. Every single day we're under all sorts of different security attacks and there's no quick fix. Right? How many of you run antivirus software on your computer? Do you get the, I don't get the point of antivirus software personally. It's always been, it's almost like you're paying for software. I know you can get free ones, but let's just use the, the paid model. You're paying for software. So you're paying this company, let's call it Norton. You're paying Norton so that you can help them gather data about the next virus. Because you're on your computer, the really dangerous viruses are the ones we don't know about, correct? Correct. I mean, for the, let's say there's a, a million viruses out there that have been around forever, they're still floating around the internet, whatever, that Norton knows about. Fine. So those are the ones that we, uh, uh, that Norton catches when it gets attached to a stupid email or something like that. Now, the reality is, those aren't really found very often, right? If you're somebody who's trying to propagate viruses over the internet, chances are you're not going to be using the old one that all the old ones that the, all the antiviruses know about. You're going to be using the new cool kids uh, modification of something that the antivirus programs don't know about. That way you can infect people, correct? So you have this program on your computer that's sitting there scanning every email, scanning all the stuff that you do on the web, looking for viruses that haven't been really found in the wild, if you will, for five years. So if it does happen to stumble across one, maybe it helps you. But chances are, the really dangerous ones, the ones that are going to be prevalent on the internet today, are going to be the brand new viruses that Norton doesn't know about yet. So you download it to your computer through an email or whatever, however you acquired the virus. Norton doesn't know it's a virus. So as it's ripping the crap out of your computer, Norton's sending data back so that they can release the fix for everybody else, not you. But by the, time there's, by the time the fix is out, by the time Norton releases their patch to protect against this virus, the virus has already done its damage to a bunch of people, right? So, it doesn't, I don't get the point. Are we better off just reinstalling our OS every three, or three weeks or so? Especially with cloud computing today where you can just restore everything. I don't know. Just seems like an unnecessary slowdown for our computer, an unnecessary burden on our hard drive to have something like Norton on there where we're paying somebody to collect data to help other people. I guess that's not a very Christian way of thinking about it, but, <laughs> but still. <laughs> I'm not listening to this crap. <laughs> oh. 
Oh, did it? Marginal scars. Marginal scars. Makes sense. It ransacked your last, last computer. And now it's played all stress at Narnia. <laughs> well, and by the way, for those of you, I know I announced this in pretty much every class. Everybody in here is using cloud storage for all of their important stuff now. Whether it be Dropbox or Box, Boxy or whatever, whatever program you want to use, I don't care. All of us have the files that if our computer literally lit on fire right now, we wouldn't want to use. You're storing that somewhere in, in memory? In, in cloud storage. If you're not, stop being an idiot. It's free. It's free. All right. So uh, when when a student comes to me and says, "Oh, you know, I was working on a, my 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 semester long project and I had it," they say backed up on their hard drive on their computer, and I laugh, ha ha. Um, there's no excuse for computer science majors or minors to not have their stuff in the cloud today. They, I should be able to take any of your laptops and just horrifically destroy it. And you haven't had, actually lost any of your data. You've lost your temper. <laughs> but none of your data. All right, so I guess remember that. But in any case, security is our big hot topic in the world today, right? We're constantly under bombardment, whether it's our operating systems on the desktop, whether it's our operating systems on the smartphone, doesn't matter. We're just... Security uh, things everywhere. And it comes from all sorts of strange places, right? A lot of the bugs last year, the, the weird uh, cracks for iPhone dealt with their, uh, uh, some bug in their PDF subsystem. You know, somebody found a, a buffer overflow um, a problem in the PDF program and was able to take advantage of it to install crap on the computer. In fact, I, for those of you who jailbreak your, uh, uh, your iPhones, your iPod touches, that was the kind of the cool kid's way of jailbreaking, you could do it right from a website. You know, you went to a website, instead of having to hook it in your computer and do all sorts of crazy stuff, you just went to this website, you clicked on a PDF, and the PDF did the rest. Jailbroke your phone for you. <laughs> do it while you're in the car. You didn't have to hook it up to anything. Very convenient. Um, okay. Uh, so systems generally first distinguish among users to determine who can do what. Uh, so we have user identities, user IDs. These are all things that we're used to from various, you know, other classes we've dealt with. Uh, different users have different uh, security settings, potentially. Um, user IDs are then associated with files. Who owns what file? You know, this is mostly seen on multi-user operating systems like Unix, where if I have files in my home directory, I don't want Amish here to be able to come and read them, necessarily. I need to choose for that to happen. I own my files, he owns his files. Um, so that's a way in a multi-user operating system to keep you know, security between users. Uh, but every operating system is going to have some level of security amongst files where there's files that we created as the users, our Word documents, things like that, and then there's the files that are important to the operating system that either we can't even read without administrator uh, access. Sometimes you have to put in your administrator program or uh, password in order to install something because it has to overwrite a file or add something to the registry or something like that on Windows. Um, you know, or it's read-only, but we can't change it. That makes sense? So those are some different security things we might run into. And those are typically files that are owned by the operating system or at least important to the operating system's functionality. Uh, here's that privilege escalation thing. That's when, you know, you're installing something that says enter your administrator password to continue or something. You know, I can't do this crap without more privileges. Blah, blah. All right. Distributed computing, collection of, se uh, collection of separate, possibly heterogeneous systems networked together. Network is a communication path, so we can have local area networks linked together. We can have wide area networks, so maybe we have our network here linked to MechOne's, uh, um, you know, council servers or something like that. You have this idea of a metropolitan area network, and nobody talks about these. That's just stupid. Okay? Uh, it's been around forever, but basically anything that's not a local area network is considered a wide area network. And wide area networks just come in different sizes. All right, so in our computer lab down there, we have a miniature local area network. And that local area network becomes one of the nodes as part of a larger local area network that is maybe this building. 
you know, this, this wing of campus, which is a node in a larger local area network. And at some point, we just start calling it a wide area network. Maybe it's a wide area network when you, you know, change zip codes or something like that. Somewhere there's a gray area in there. Does that make sense? So these are all just terms for stuff, but almost everything, every time we're thinking about networking, we're thinking of them as LANs. You know, we've all heard of a LAN party. Do we still, do people still do LAN parties? It's still a thing? It is? I watch them on YouTube, they're funny. You watch LAN parties on YouTube? Yeah. That's very sad. <laughs> no, it's real funny. <laughs> Why go to a LAN party when you can just watch a live stream of a LAN party? It's almost like being there. <laughs> <laughs> they just live stream everything today, right? It's actually, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I remember, uh, you know, we had to sign up with the cable company. I actually had to go down to the cable company to sign up for uh, the pay-per-view for WrestleMania. I remember going down there with my dad. We signed up for WrestleMania 1. Man, were you, you weren't even alive when WrestleMania 1. What are we on, WrestleMania 100 now? How many WrestleManias have we had? A lot, right? Almost as many as we've had survivor seasons. <laughs> I, remember, I remember when Survivor, you know, first came out it was like a super popular show, and now we're like Survivor season forty-three or something like that. We're catching up to the Simpsons. Um, so, in uh, in any case, uh, um, we live stream everything now, and. Uh, you know, I could see, see sitting there and you, just, um, well, I was with the pay-per-view thing. I was thinking, uh, I read recently uh, that Blizzard has this big event every year called BlizzCon. And, um, you know, I guess they always sell out really, really fast. So what do they do? They live stream the event and charge you for that. So it's pay-per-view for a video game convention that they sold out for so you can't go. It's like genius, right? We should have our own live stream convention. Doesn't matter. This dude's watching land parties. <laughs> Streaming him watching a stream. <laughs> <laughs> this is a land party dedicated to watching live streams. So we're gonna have a live stream of a live stream watching live stream land party. Land party. Live stream. <laughs> I figure I had to. I think you have to put live, live stream at the end of that sentence to make it not make sense. All right, so make sense. Uh, network operating systems provide features between systems across uh, uh, a bigger network. So we might have, <laughs> that's good. Remember the other day I told you that my doctor said he needed to see me immediately? Yeah. Now he's calling again, that's good. <laughs> he's listening to the message in class. <laughs> Say, you really want to stop by the morgue? <laughs> get fit. <laughs> I want to get you fit for a casket. Um, what was I talking about? Oh, so one of the and really this the idea of a distributed operating system is is kind of um, um I don't know like a, a dream if you will. We've been talking about distributed operating systems for years, almost having the operating system in the cloud, and we're all just part of it. Um, you know, we're, we're all you know, doing all of our productivity uh, using that, where we have this one vast operating system that no matter where we are on Earth, we're all part of this thing. So that would be the, kind of the extreme example of this, where from our perspective, our experience is as if, as, is as if the operating system is sitting here locally and all the computing power is sitting here locally. So that would be a goal of a network operating system. Typically, when we think about our network operating systems, it's not really distributed. It's a central Unix operating system that we are remoting into. So it's not truly distributed. The users are distributed, but they're coming into a central location. So it becomes kind of a, you know, a dream, if you will. Uh, special purpose systems. We have real-time embedded systems, most prevalent forms of computers. Um, uh, We've seen a bunch of these in the last couple of years, um, you know, programmable ones like Raspberry Pi and Arduino are examples of, of two of those things. But a lot of things are on, a, uh, you've, you've maybe heard the phrase uh, system on a chip uh, with various things where they can come out with these re really, really, really s small devices that actually do something. 
and inside of it is an entire integrated operating system built onto a single chip. So that one chip has enough cache and stuff like that on it to fake the hard drive. You know, so it's just got enough. It's not something we would think of as general purpose, but it is a full working computer. Um, you know, here's for you, our multimedia system. So these would be like streaming servers, stuff like that. Um, and then we have all sorts of uh, handheld uh, PDAs and things like that, which we could almost say aren't as special purpose as they historically were anymore. These guys are computing at kind of the same level as we're doing with our laptops. It just becomes, you know, like, oh, this is easier to do with an app versus sitting down in front of your computer doing something. So maybe these become less special purpose. All right, so, and this is kind of what we were just saying, computing environments, how are we actually doing our computing? This is blurring over time. The idea of a computer keeps changing, right? This guy was a phone 10 years ago. How many of you actually think of your smartphone as a phone first today? A lot of us, maybe not, right? Just the one pizza maker. What was that? You think of yours as a phone first? Do you talk on it? Really? Did you bring some pizza at some point in time? Yeah, seriously, what's up? It's not our problem. <laughs> That's true. So the least you could have done is brought an offering. <laughs> I just realized something. I've had this phone for, was it two weeks now? I made my first phone call on it last night. And the phone call was to help my dad set up his new iPhone. <laughs> See? I don't even care if this thing makes phone calls. Stupid anyways. Um, Except for your doctor. Huh? Except for your doctor. No, uh, I'll email him through uh, my Aurora chart thing. I don't call back. Dumb. Just email me. Come on. All right. So anyways, our idea of computing environments keeps changing. Now we see our phones as computers. Um, you know, in the early days, we saw desktops as our computer and laptops were, oh, if we need to be on the go, you know, now we get a laptop. Anymore, if you're buying a new PC today, how many of you don't even consider a tower? You just go right to a laptop. You know, the idea of mobility becomes almost a necessity, especially from a student perspective. But our laptops today are almost as powerful as, uh, or really are as powerful as our desktops. The only real thing you're trading off there is screen size. Is that a fair enough assessment by today's standards? You know, you go back 10 years, laptops were substantially less powerful than, the, than their desktop equivalents. Now, with a laptop, you have a little bit less uh, um, flexibility when it comes to graphics cards and stuff like that. So if you're building these gaming machines, that's why you still build the desktop uh, ones. Building a laptop yourself isn't really something people do. Um, which is actually interesting. You'd think that would have become kind of popular, but it didn't. You'd think people would be building gaming laptops, but they're so integrated where the uh, um, graphics cards themselves a lot of times are on the motherboard and all that crap. But uh, in any case, if you're building a gaming rig or something like that, you're still dealing with desktops probably, so you have that kind of flexibility. But otherwise, if you're buying a computer, chances are you're buying a laptop. So desktop sales are really down. Um, that's a wasted comment there, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, we've talked about this a little bit lately uh, with web servers, things like that, client-server computing. Um, uh, this idea of dumb terminals, uh, which died a long time ago. Somebody should probably let Dr. Locklear know that. Because one room over here, he refuses to get, a, get rid of our wall where we have a bunch of dumb terminals set up. He's had it since I got here. Well, he's had it for longer than that. But since I got here, they were antiquated by a decade, minimum. And he still has them. They don't work. It's just stupid. In any case, they were called dumb terminals. It was essentially a monitor, a keyboard, not a mouse. This was prior to mouse, uh, mice, that were connected to some sort of central server. But instead of connecting to it over the internet, it was connected to it over like parallel cables. You know, local so the you know the, the the server would be sitting ten feet from you. You were cable you know connected to it through a cable, um, and you'd be sitting there and you were using this shared operating system that was actually hosted in that central computer. 
Now we don't need our Unix server to be sitting right next to us. It can be over in Russia um, because we can use the internet to connect to it. Um, many systems now servers. Am I reading that funny or is that just wrong? Many systems now servers respond to requests generated by clients. Probably supposed to be a comma, comma here maybe? Yeah. All right, whatever. Um, so compute servers. So this is kind of a, a, a modern term that we see with cloud computing stuff. Um, so, you know, and, and it's a good way of charging money. So if you go to uh, some of Google's cloud services, one of Google's cloud services is something called their compute engine, which just sounds fancy, right? You know, what's a compute engine? It means they have a computer up in the sky somewhere or a group of computers up in the sky somewhere and we're going to send requests to that computer for it to actually do our computations rather than for it to happen on our local machine. Maybe it's expensive computations. Uh, you know, let's think in the academic world, maybe it's some giant research simulation or something like that that might take a week to run or a lot longer on our hardware. And we want to instead rent compute power. Isn't it funny how much, how more impressive saying compute power is than computing power. Because compute just sounds cool. It sounds like it's worth so many fractions of a cent per compute minute or something however they, they break it down. It's, it's the world we live in. Um, so you have the idea of taking our computation into the cloud or just our file server into the cloud. So Dropbox would be file server in the cloud, right? All our crap is synced up there as it is here, and they're not computing crap for us. You know, we're not sending a program up there for them to run for us. They're just holding all of our data in a big bucket. All right, so those are file servers, compute servers, do the other thing. Google offers both for a fee. Their, their file servers are something called their data store. Their compute server, I think, is just called Google Compute Cloud or something like that. Very... Uh, imaginative. So again, more examples of distributed computing. And this is just the world we live in, where we're trying to take things and put them in other places so that our laptops can get destroyed or stolen and it's not a big deal other than money. It's a far cry from the history of things where you have the joke that my dog ate my homework. Now it's, you know, my computer got a virus. Or my computer crashed. You know, then you ask, what does crash mean? And you know, they try to explain to you, and it doesn't sound like a crash. What does it even mean when somebody says their computer crashes? My dad was having problems setting up his iPhone last night, and he, he texts me and says, my iPhone locked up. So I call him and ask him, you know, tell him what happened. And so 45 minutes later, after he tells me how he ordered it from this place and got it from AT&T and plugged it into iTunes, he tells me this whole backstory of everything. He just finally tells me, oh, it locked up because of the the progress bar stopped moving as it was saying it was syncing my apps. That's what locked up means to him. Yeah. Uh, point to point, this is something, uh, well, peer to peer, point to point, whatever. Uh, this is something that's come into uh, um, great popularity over the last decade or so as we are um, sharing perfectly legal files over the internet. Um, so instead of having one central location, this is another example of distributed computing, instead of having one central location, we have everybody being their own little node. So how many of you have ever been on a peer-to-peer -peer network, participated in it? Early ones, maybe Napster was one. Um, since then we've had, what, a couple hundred different ones? That's, you know, if they get taken offline, somebody else steps in <laughs> as a new one. Um, the whole idea of BitTorrent is peer-to-peer. -peer. Okay? So, you know, a peer-to-peer -peer network uh, in its natural state is instead of having a central server, all of us in here are potential servers. So we're peers among each other. Some of us want to serve information. Some of us want to download information. And there's some sort of central repository that allows us to all connect to that so that we can connect to each other. Okay, and the, the value of that deals with bypassing firewalls. You know, so if you were trying to connect to uh, a, buddy, uh, a buddy's computer who lives 
you know, in Texas. You know, they're and they're on a cable modem. They're going to get some fake IP address, uh, what's called a non-routable IP address from their cable modem provider. Here on campus, you're probably getting a real IP address, but you're sitting behind a firewall. In any case, they can't directly connect to you. You can't directly connect to them. Because both of you guys are effectively behind a firewall. But if you have a central place that you both can connect to, and then that one place could connect you two together, tie the knot, now all of a sudden, uh, you have communication between two people that were otherwise behind a firewall. Another example of distributed computing. So that central server isn't a compute engine. It's not a file server. It's really a networker, a, connect a connector. You're both connecting to one place, so you open that door and then we're hooking you together. So that's how peer-to-peer -peer, um, networks work. So each node must join the peer-to-peer -peer network, and then it does the rest. Oh, Nutella, I forgot about that one. Isn't that also that chocolate spread? Love that stuff. And just get that with a spoon. Have you ever had that with peanut butter on a sandwich? I think so. That's good stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, you really can't go wrong. I mean, Nutella plus peanut butter is like a, it's like a peanut butter cup but in spoonable format. You don't have to worry about those wrappers and stuff. Worst invention in the world is a tiny, the mini peanut butter cups that you have, they're individually wrapped. You can't eat just one of those. I mean, that's the example we're gonna use. When we start talking about CPU scheduling, somebody remind me, when I talk about uh, um, uh, moving from uh, uh, what's called context switching. Spending so much time copying stuff into some sort of other directory so that we can move a process off the CPU so another guy can come in just to get work done. We're wasting our time doing all this stuff, just like eating those mini Reese's peanut butter cups. You need, well, what they really need to do is they need to come out with giant peanut butter cups like the size of a pizza pan. Man, people would buy that like as a pie. I know they have like peanut, you know, Reese's pies and stuff. But I mean, literally have it be the form factor of a peanut butter cup served on a pizza pan. I'm liking the sound of that a lot. Um, all right. So anyways, that's your peer-to-peer -peer computing stuff, mostly for illegal crap and bypassing firewalls. Doesn't mean there isn't reasonable technology behind the scenes there that could be used for good, but typically that's what it's been used for. Um, web-based computing. Web has been become ubiquitous. So a while ago, web was cool. You know, we're not getting a whole lot of new, interesting innovations in web because web and using an application sitting on your computer has almost become the same thing. Just look at Chrome OS as an example. Anybody in here have a Chromebook? Is that that's not one? That's an HP, but you have one. Yeah. So I mean, literally the Chromebook and what they call Chrome OS is the Chrome web browser. It's a laptop that runs the Chrome web browser. That's it. And all the plugins that go into it. So your Office thing is you know, Google Docs and you know all, all, all that other crap. So we've gotten to the point now where we can have app, full running applications running inside of a web browser that are basically, from a, at least from a business app perspective, as full featured as a standalone application might be. And then we come from the gaming side of things. Well, you're not going to have your latest, greatest, coolest, pick your favorite game. You know, uh, We're nowhere near having the game Battlefield being launched out of a web browser. That's not where we are. But certainly small games, you know, I could say Angry Birds, but even games substantially more complex than that can launch out of a web browser. So if you're a hardcore video game player, from a PC gamer, Probably not getting a Chromebook, but you can do a lot of gaming from a Chromebook, uh, specifically if you're one of those online gamblers. Maybe you do that stuff. I always get the invites uh, on Facebook to, you know, buy so many chips and get a bunch of chips free or something like that. I thought gambling was like illegal if you weren't like on water. Is there some by, is there like an internet bypass of that? No, it's still pretty illegal. 
Like all those sites are illegal if you're using real money? Yeah, it's still pretty illegal. Really? So like, They're just in Europe or whatever. Oh, so we can't get to them. Well, you can. It's just... Well, they don't fall under United States right. jurisdiction. So it's a different level of illegal. Yeah. It would be illegal for U.S. citizens to do it, but not illegal for them to offer it. Either that or they're on a boat. Seriously. How does Potawatomi get away with it? Are they actually on water? Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, you either got to be on water or an Indian reserve. Makes sense. It's a good racket. Man, if I was on an Indian reservation, you were getting screwed over by the government, I'd open a casino and just make bank. <laughs> if you can't beat them, join them, right? Uh, what was I talking about? Oh, so web-based computing. Blurry line now between that and normal computing. Um, we say PCs are the most prevalent device, but that's even less true today than it was when this book was written. You know, this is a couple of years ago. Um, you know, for real, it's I guess it's still pretty true. For actual web browser-based computing, PCs are still the way to do it. You're probably not going to be doing a lot of um, web-based computing stuff on a smartphone. Instead, there's going to be an app for that, for working with that stuff, or, or just be inconvenient. Um, you know, Flash was our major delivery source for a lot of these, uh, at least the games. Now it's kind of moving more towards HTML5, but it's still a 50-50 split. You're not going to get the uh, Flash stuff on your uh, mobile devices. HTML5 on mobile devices, it's fine. But how many of you are going to go to a website and play on your smartphone and play an HTML5 game if there's the equivalent app to download? None of us, right? I mean, the, the way to play games on your smartphone is through an app. The way to do app, the way to do computing on your smartphone is through an app. What do you use your web, web browser for? Mostly news digesting and, and, and stuff like that. Logging into a bank account that doesn't have an app, that, that kind of stuff. Um, so... Having a desktop computer or something like a Chromebook really exemplifies this idea of web-based computing where we can do a lot of stuff in a full-fledged desktop web browser. Okay, so we have a new category of device to manage web traffic among similar servers. We talked about this with Google, this idea of a load balancer. So we think we're hitting one server, but there's actually a zillion servers behind the, scene, behind the scenes, and Google is determining which one that's least busy to send us to. That's the load balancer server that we're connecting to. So all that guy does is pick up the phone for the request and send us off to, to another computer to actually do the computing. All right, because that, you know, we can't have one computer sitting at Google that's doing all the web searching for everybody at the same time. There's too many... Too many requests. Uh, use of operating systems like Windows 95, uh, client side have, evol have evolved into Linux and Windows XP, which uh, can be client and servers. Um, even that's a slight lie. We can there's there's client uh, server applications you could have uh, run on Windows 95, but by today's standards, we can certainly have a Windows XP machine set up as a server. You know, not meant for a person to actually be sitting at it. You know, maybe it's just the the a network administrator who goes there and installs an update or something, but you know these types of computers become clients and servers. Uh, open source. What do you know about open source? What's good? What's bad about it? So what's open source? Go ahead. People can look at the code and change things and do whatever they want with them without having to get permission. Okay. So open source, the source code for, for a program is available. Typically open source projects also have some sort of community around them where if you wanted to participate and contribute to the project, you can. Um, there's usually some sort of governing body that you know, makes some decisions as to which updates they allow to be part of the official distribution and which ones are you know, considered third-party add-ons or something. But in any case... You know, you have full access to it in order to make, make updates to it. Uh, something that we sometimes do in um, uh, more programming-focused operating systems courses is we actually will look at the source code of uh, an operating system and break it down. What we'll do in here is we'll write 
you know, we'll do some programming writing mockups of some of the different features of an operating system, but not actually have a full functioning operating system. Is open source good? If you're cheap. Okay. Well, definitely if you're cheap. Open source typically means free, right? So if you're cheap, open source is definitely good. All right. Um, what are some what are some downsides to being open source? Okay, why is that a downside? Okay, um, so you might have stability issues. Um, what about uh, what about the perceived quality? So let's just take a, a good example. So we have uh, Open Office, is kind of the micro the open source Microsoft clone, Microsoft Office clone, right? How many of you use Open Office in here? Okay, a couple of you. Uh, then you have Microsoft Office. How many of you use Microsoft Office in here? Okay, more of you. Which is better? How many of you probably think that Microsoft Office is a superior product, but because it has a cost associated with it, you settle for Open Office? Probably not a horribly unfair assessment, right? If they were both free, how many of you who currently use Open Office would probably go and use Microsoft Office? I mean, I have both, but I, I open, I use Open Office more often. Okay, what's your rationale? When, when do you use Open Office versus Microsoft Office? Open Office starts a lot faster. Well, I've definitely noticed that. <laughs> a lot faster, so um, that's pretty much it. Just I can get to work on documents quick. quick. Okay. So realistically speaking, if somebody sent you a document, it's probably specifically maybe a spreadsheet that was in Excel format that you figured might have a lot of formulas in it, you might go ahead and spend the time to open it in Excel just so you don't have weird compatibility problems. But if you were just writing a paper... I don't have too many compatibility Yeah, I don't have too many problems, but if, you, if somebody was sending you a really technical spreadsheet where they had a lot of crazy formulas in it and stuff like that, I probably would just trust Excel... What they were, what, which is what they created it in more so than Open Office's uh, um, Excel clone. Um, but if you're going to write a term paper or something like that, you know, not, not a big deal. You might as well just get the program open and get going, right? Okay. Uh, and I noticed that too. Like, for instance, I have Microsoft Office on here, but I also have iWork, which is Apple's version of that. Um, and I almost always open PowerPoints using Keynote. If I double click, so like this, for instance, is a PowerPoint uh, presentation, but I open it up in Keynote. If I double click on it, to, by default, it'll open up in PowerPoint on here. And PowerPoint takes like three minutes to launch. I don't even understand it. It's ridiculous. But in any case, um, so there really is two sides of the coin, and this becomes a real contention point uh, in today's computing. We even, you know, we've talked a little bit about it with uh, Android versus uh, iOS. Android being an open source operating system, iOS not being an open source operating system. And they both have, you know, their, their pros and cons, but one of the things we see for any of you running something that's not a uh, Nexus device for Android users, you're getting a bastardized version of Android. Somebody who's taken Android and modified it in some way, hopefully a minor way, but possibly a major way. Just before we get too far away from... Uh Word starting up. It's, it's interesting that the client virtualization handler for Word, if you use that instead of Word, it opens fairly fast. So there's there's something between there's something between when you start like what they want you to click mm -hmm. on to start Word and the use, just using the virtualization yeah. handler. I know that they have I mean I know it's checking for updates and stuff, and they also have this uh I thought it was open on here right now. They also have this reminders um, application that launches in the background. Um, that might be something, but I think there's other things that are getting launched as part of that double click. That I, so I think you're right. Um, but in any case, uh, open source isn't necessarily better or worse. It just has its own caveats. Done. And we're out of time.
Well, chapter one was a pretty big chapter. That was a lot of slides that we had there. All right, so we'll come back next time. Um, we'll start looking at the chapter two slide set. I'm going to actually go through that pretty quick, kind of like we did today, um, because we've kind of covered that stuff in some of my tangents. Um, and then we're going to jump into process management. All right, I will see everybody on Monday.